What's up, my friend? Mike Robertson here, and my newest, most favorite intern right now, Sandy, has asked for a tutorial on medicine ball training. Now, this is not meant to be an all-encompassing approach to medicine ball training, but it's things I think will benefit either her or you get a little bit better with regards to understanding why we would use med ball training, where it fits into your program, and how to coach and cue it more effectively. So, kind of got a little bit of a breakdown here. We'll go through these and just help you better understand why we use medicine ball training here at IFAS. So to start, why do we do it? I got four reasons, probably more out there, but these are the four that I'm constantly thinking of when I'm writing medicine balls into a program. Number one is just tissue prep. So you'll see a lot of what I call micro ballistics or low, low amplitude throws, nice and easy, fluid and relaxed. And I think this is great tissue prep for the upper body, okay? You see upper body variations, lower body variations, but I really like some of these micro ballistics and half kneeling, tall kneeling with a bouncy medicine ball to just prep the shoulders, the pecs, all of those upper extremity tissues for more explosive and reactive loading. So I like it for tissue prep. Obviously, very easy one is power development. Great thing about medicine balls, it's not like a jump where you have to land depending on which medicine ball variation you're using, you can literally just chuck that thing as hard as you want, it hits the wall, and then you can bend over, pick it up, and do it again. So whether we're training upper body power, lower body power, power is the name of the game, and if you wanna make your athletes more powerful, more explosive, medicine balls are a safe and effective way to do that. Number three, movement training. And this is probably the biggest reason that I do it. Obviously, I want power development, but I love medicine balls, I love sled drags and things of that nature because they allow you to find and feel certain positions. So when it comes to movement training, let's say I'm taking a volleyball player or a basketball player or a baseball player and I'm trying to teach them how to shuffle. We can teach them the actual movement, but you can use medicine ball training as a derivative of that to teach some of those constituent parts. So if I want to teach somebody to push and be explosive in a side-to-side -side fashion, medicine ball training can help me do that. In fact, this morning I had a basketball player in, I had a volleyball player in. Shuffling side to side is imperative to them being fast and explosive. So this is a great way to start to build those movement patterns in a very safe and effective environment. And then last but not least, when it comes to medicine ball training, I'm all about fun. When you're training athletes, generally I feel like that training is a little bit more fun anyway. I'm biased, I get that. But especially when you're training gen pop clients, a lot of them may not love the weight room to begin with. And number two, if all you're doing is banging weights, it can get very monotonous to them. So I love medicine ball training, not only with my athletes, but with my gen pop clients, just to make things more fun. We get to train power, we get to train explosiveness, but anytime you can make the training more engaging and more fun, I feel like it increases buy-in and you get more out of the sessions. So those are four of the reasons that I use medicine ball training in my programs. Now let's talk a little bit about models and why we might use this to build linear movement, okay? So if you're training any form of athlete that needs to accelerate, there's a certain movement model that we're trying to chase, right? So we want kind of angled tibia, right? We want knee over the toe. We want to be able to push out of this position to accelerate and be fast. But maybe somebody doesn't tolerate doing a lot of that very well early on in their program. I can put them in this kind of position and train medicine ball throws following that same linear movement model. So once you understand what an acceleration should look like, again, chasing the shoulders, knee over toe, big push, once you understand that model, now you can incorporate medicine ball training into that movement model. Another great way to do this is with our lateral movement. And again, we talked about lateral movement just a few minutes ago, but when I've got somebody set up, I want a good base, I want their feet wider than shoulder width apart, and I want them to feel their arches. So imagine a basketball player, they're in a good defensive stance. They can push and shuffle in either direction. Same thing in volleyball or in baseball. You gotta shuffle to receive a serve or to field a ground ball. The lateral movement is such a big piece of sport performance. And I love putting my athletes in this position in a lot of different environments. So maybe we're shuffling with a band. Maybe we're shuffling without a band to try and work on speed. But again, we can use that medicine ball training to reinforce these good positions and teaching our athletes to move more effectively. So we got lateral movement and then we've got stability and control. So in this case, these are those micro ballistics. So maybe we're in a half kneeling position. We got one knee down, 
and we're just kind of lightly dribbling the ball against the wall or in a tall kneeling position. Anytime you're in a half kneeling, tall kneeling position, I'm thinking more about stability and control versus building a specific movement pattern or maybe displaying power. So lots of different movement models that we can play around with. And when we go over here and we coach this, I'll dive into it in a little bit more depth just so you can see exactly how I coach and cue this with my clients and with my athletes. Next, we have a multitude of variations. And again, this isn't supposed to be all encompassing, but when we talk about variations, two of the biggest differences or two of the biggest variations that I like to play around with are a scoop toss versus more of a shot put style toss. Okay, so let's imagine we're doing that lateral movement kind of base. So we're here. If I'm using more of a scoop position where I'm taking the ball down low, what that allows me to do, I feel like is load my hips more effectively. It keeps my arms long, which in turn keeps my lats out of it. A lot of times people will get really archy when they do this stuff. And I don't want the power coming from the lower back so much as I want the abs, the hips, everything working in concert to produce that power. So with a lot of athletes that have a tendency to get really archy, really extended, I'm going to take them out of that shot put position and put them in more of this scoop position to help them load the hip more effectively. Now, contrast that with somebody that doesn't get in that archy position. Or you've got, maybe as Bill would describe it, a narrow ISA, somebody that has a tendency to turn or rotate a lot, or they're just a low force producer. For this person, I want that compression, I want that squeeze. So I want them to squish that medicine ball, lock everything in, and then push and go. So depending on the athlete you're working with and their specific needs, that would help you understand, do I want to use more of a scoop throw initially, or do I want to use more of a shot put style throw? As well, when we're thinking more straight ahead, we can do, again, our shot put or like our chest pass. As well, if you're working with an overhead athlete, that's where you can go up overhead and do more stepping and throwing type variations. Now, this is probably a better example, again, if you're working with an overhead athlete. Let's say you're working with somebody in baseball, tennis, swimming, where they're repeatedly overhead. That's more where I would progress them into those overhead variations versus, uh, let's say somebody plays football. They play rugby. That's where I'd use more of these shot put variations where it's more keeping everything in tight, exploding right directly from the chest. So you just try and figure out which variation is going to be best for this specific athlete based on the sport that they play. And as well, just keep in mind, just because somebody goes overhead in their sport doesn't mean they have uh, all of the constituent parts to go overhead as safely and as effectively as we'd like. So even if somebody is an overhead athlete, we may start more with these shot put variations and then progress them into overhead variations as we build the requisite overhead mobility. More variations. This is where, you know, we can talk about half kneeling. So one knee down, tall kneeling, both knees down. We can get into a split stance, which is just think that like basically the top of a split squat or lunge, or we could do a staggered stance where both feet are on the ground. I'll put a link in uh, the video notes. I wrote an entire article on this, why you might choose one stance or variation over the other, but there's all kinds of different positions you can play around with. Last but not least, another variation that I tend to think a lot about is, am I just throwing the ball or am I throwing and catching the ball? And this will kind of directly move into momentum here in a minute. But if somebody struggles to produce force, one of the first things I may want them to do is learn how to generate some compression, get tight, and then throw. So that's where I may use a throw only. Or let's say I have an older client or an older athlete. They're not great at accepting forces or they haven't done any power training up to this point. That's where it may be just that one-off expression. They're loaded, big push, let the ball hit the ground. Okay, pick it up, load it up, step and throw. So we could do a throw only. But there's also a time and a place for a throw and a catch. So let's say somebody's very rigid, stiff. That's where I may want to do something more fluid and relaxed. I'm getting them to expand and compress, right? Push, relax, push, relax. It also could be if somebody's very, very tight and I'm trying to use momentum to get them into a position. So imagine we're in this lateral movement type base. I throw the medicine ball. I throw it hard. I'm close to the wall. Bang, I catch it and then I hold for a one count. We talk about yielding here in just a little while, but if I throw, receive, 
maybe take an inhale. Now I'm tying all these pieces together to use it, but I'm using that momentum to help dissipate force on the back end and get them into a better position. So there's all kinds of different variations that you can use. It really just comes down to why do you want to use it and how is it going to benefit the athlete, okay? So once we talk about variations, then we can talk about momentum. And I know this is something that Sandy was interested in, something that I've really tried hard to build into my programs. And I think a great way to think about this is how do you build out a medicine ball progression over an off season? Because if we have our standard lateral movement base, we're here. And month one, all we're doing is push, step, throw. Push, step, throw. If we want to learn how to control momentum, that's not how sports work, right? We don't get to just stay in this position and never move. So what we may do instead is, hey, let's build these micro progressions of momentum into the workout. Okay, so if somebody's got to change direction, they have to put their foot out wide, they have to control their center of mass, center of gravity, because we don't want them way over here, they're going to fall over. So we need to teach them, hey, how do I find that arch, load my body effectively, and then come out of it? So a micro progression here, instead of just being in the static position where I'm already set, is I start feet together and then shot, put, scoop, whatever variation you want, load, push, load, push. So we're starting to add elements of momentum into the equation. From there, we go from static to a step away. Now, maybe we move into more of a shuffle. So I'm here, one shuffle away, right? So I'm adding speed. I'm adding intensity. One shuffle could become two shuffles. So the more momentum you have, the harder your body has to work to stop, find the right foot position, foot angle, and power out of it, okay? So this is a very easy way to build intensity into your med ball program. You can also shuffle in. So instead of working to load and change direction, maybe if I'm working to help somebody accelerate more effectively, now I'm gonna shuffle in towards the, the wall and throw the ball from there. So again, starting away, and maybe it's one shuffle, two shuffles, but this will help you learn that lateral acceleration mechanic, okay? One final thing to think about here is the medicine ball mass. And I think this is very, very important because even small jumps in weight can make a profound impact on how the movement looks and feels. And I feel like too often as an industry, we get way too heavy with medicine ball training too fast. So sure, you can go out and get that 50 pound heavy medicine ball, but you're gonna look really slow coming in and out of your cuts. So I would say if anything, I err on the side of less weight versus more. So maybe it's only a four or six pound medicine ball, but if I want somebody to feel fast coming into or out of a cut, I'm gonna try and use a lighter medicine ball because that's what I want that feeling to feel like. I don't want them to feel like they're stuck in the mud. You know, there's a time and a place for that with a certain athlete, like where I may want to slow them down a little bit, but most of your low force producers or your people that have that tendency to go into a cut and never come out, they need a light medicine ball to help them transition out of that quickly and effectively. Variables. So when it comes to your prescription, when you start writing programs, what variables do we need to think about? Well, again, we kind of talked about this medicine ball mass, very, very important. If you're dealing with a narrow ISA, uh, a low force producer, generally lighter is better. With some of your wider archetypes, your people that are very compressed, they may need a little bit of load to help them find and hit the right positions. Okay, so choosing the right mass, medicine ball is important, but also the type. And this is where you've got like the big kind of oversized ones that have a tendency to die. I feel like those are great for your pure power production, uh, for some of your catch and throw variations. But when we're talking about our micro ballistics, where we're thinking about upper body tissue prep, that's where our rubber bouncy type medicine balls really shine. And that's where I'll use a lot of those. So, you know, especially if I'm thinking uh, baseball, volleyball, tennis, any kind of overhead athlete, we're going to incorporate a lot of those micro ballistics in there just to get their body their upper body tissues prepped for the sport that they're gonna play. Time under tension, again, is a big one. So I like to think of those two ends of the spectrum. So if you got your low force producers, your narrow ISAs, they're gonna need a lot more of the overcoming type work, right? You want them to feel fast coming into and out of a cut. Uh, maybe a two or a four pound medicine ball, it's gotta be fast, it's gotta be explosive. 
On the flip side of that, if you have a wide ISA, if you have somebody that struggles to yield, right, like they just can't get into a cut, right, they can't sit into a squat, we may use the medicine ball and the mass of the medicine ball to get more of a yielding effect. So we want them to dissipate or uh, distribute some of those forces more effectively. So the time under tension and how you prescribe that is very dependent on the person you have in front of you and what you've targeted or determined some of their specific needs to be. Sets and reps, this should be pretty straightforward. Again, micro ballistics is generally a higher volume, more extensive approach. So if I'm putting somebody in that half kneeling position, we may be doing it for time, you know, 10 to 15 seconds. We may be doing it for higher volumes, like 15 to 20 reps per set. And then if our goal is power, we need to chase power. So uh, you shouldn't be doing sets of 10, 15, 20. If the goal is power, you need to be doing fives, sixes. And the intent is very, very important. This is something that I try and express to my athletes, and I'll do it in the coaching. Uh, Sandy's probably tired of hearing me say it, but I always joke around, break the wall, right? We've got like this huge, like four inch thick cement wall. They're never going to break it, but I want them to try. There has to be that level of intent where they're really trying to just destroy that medicine ball, destroy that wall, because that's the level of intent we need if we really want to make them more, more fast or more explosive. And then the final one, which we kind of talked about up here, is momentum. So if you're trying to help somebody accelerate, you can use the mass of the medicine ball to generate more momentum. On the flip side, if somebody is working to change direction, if you got a really heavy medicine ball, it's gonna be really hard to stop. They're gonna really wanna dissipate and distribute that force before they come out. So be conscious of the mass of the medicine ball, how much weight you're using, and make sure it's reinforcing what you feel like that specific client or athlete needs.